It's my pleasure to uh, talk to you about the simple way of doing a bicuspid valve repair. It's pretty straightforward. And so I will show you two cases with some of the nuances on uh, bicuspid valve repairs. The keys are understanding the anatomy and we have a weight and a sort of schema that we work through to do that. And um, I'll show you more of, of that later. And the two patients illustrate, first of all, the simple bicuspid valve repair and then how you combine that with other procedures, in this case, a root remodeling operation. And you'll see also in uh, the typed notes, the text, some more details about the procedure and the steps we take to make a successful repair. So with that, uh, this is a young 27-year-old uh, patient with severe aortic valve regurgitation from a bicuspid valve. And there's prolapse of the leaflets, lack of coaptation, um, and also a area where there is not a conjoint and symmetrical fused uh, leaflet. So first thing here is to look at the valve and understand the anatomy. Remember that from the echo, that's usually not very good. My first step is to divide the RAFE in all these patients and um, to free that up so you have a leaflet that's mobile and it's going to co-apt well. So the RAFE has been cut away there. Then the next step is to put the valve sutures, the cabral sutures into position to bring the leaflets together to get the apposition better. And then from that, you then can start estimating uh, what you need to do. Now I hook this onto my retractor. This is a min invasive operation as you see, so limited exposure. This is probably about a six centimeter incision. And here's now the leaflet uh, being co-apted down at the base of the commissures and uh, this is coming out there obviously you've got to watch out for the left main and um, so this is the second uh, valve suture or cabral suture and I always tell the nurse I need the valve sutures so they know that this is for the cabral uh, stitch so there's now that valve on tension and the key throughout the process as you'll see is to stretch those leaflets so you have an understanding of how much plication you need to do. Now, many years ago, um, we did a study here from the Cleveland Clinic showing that plication has a much better durability than resection and sewing the leaflets together. And obviously the problem is that these leaflets can tear. Now, over many years of experimentation, in a sense, and trying different techniques, I, I find this uh, 5 O Ethibond is the best suture for repairing the uh, incomplete fusions of the leaflets uh, or prolapse. And stick to the thick past parts of the uh, tissue. For whatever reason, uh, the tissue on the right side of the commissure tends to be a bit thicker uh, in most of these patients. So I tend to not make this plication uh, always central, but um, perhaps a bit more towards the right coronary uh, part of the leaflet. And then I lock the sutures, and you'll see in a moment the reason I do that is that I can put the um, progressing a repair here uh, under tension to get a better idea of um, what it's going to look like. And so the next step now is to assess how much I still need to apply Kate there. And you never want to overdo it because then you end up with aortic valve stenosis. And the other thing is I use this horizontal mattress suture here because I hope it's less likely to tear out, and I haven't seen it tear out. Um, and so 
in a sense, you're buttressing more tissue here than with a running suture. And um, so you then tie that down and this then should be your final stitch as far as getting uh, that leaflet symmetrical. And there you see it's symmetrical now. You got the right tension. Then I have a look to make sure I have a large enough opening. I'll often put a hay gauze in there to make sure that I have a big enough uh, opening for the patient's uh, BSA. So having done that, um, then the next step is the Gore-Tex suture. I used to have uh, used the 5-0 Ethibond for this, uh, but I stopped that many years ago because I had a patient where the Ethibond tore through. I think the Gore-Tex, the PTFE, has got a bit more springiness maybe to it, and it's just a bit thicker. And I think because it's not a multi-filament suture, it's less likely to saw through uh, the tissue. And then we put a pledget on this to anchor it uh, so that it doesn't tear through the aorta. Um, if you don't do that, particularly if the, the sutures are close together, you may have some bleeding from this figure of eight suture. So uh, external pledget helps. And then I put clips on that so it doesn't unravel. Because one of the problems with Gore-Tex, as you know, is it can unravel. And then uh, we're going here to the non-coronary left commissure and same thing, hitching it up so you increase the amount of approximation of the leaflets. Depending if I think there needs some slight adjustment, I might put this off to the one or either side uh, when I tie this down to pull the leaflets in a certain direction. And here you see I've pulled it slightly towards a non-coronary uh, sinus, both uh, figure of eight uh, suspension sutures. And um, as you see that now tucks it in at a higher level. And if you look there, you can see there's a lot of height of, of approximation of the leaflets. And uh, again, what we do is make sure that this is looking good and symmetrical. And if there is any thickening um, of the non coronary leaflet uh, in this case, I will either shimmy that or um, crush that area so it folds more well into the leaflet that has been sewn together. So if you look there, there's a bit of thickening on that leaflet there. So I'm just gonna soften that up a bit so that it approximates better with the other leaflet. And so there you have a nice symmetrical re repair that should work uh, very nicely. And so you then um, start closing up. Uh, in this patient, the aorta is a, a setting aorta is a bit enlarged, but not enough to replace it. And so from that point of view, I'm just going to do aortoplasty. We've just done a study on a big series of patients with um, 400 patients in each group looking at ascending aorta replacement with bicuspid valve repair versus only bicuspid valve repair. And while I thought the benefits may be there for replacing the ascending aorta in these patients who need it, uh, we don't see any difference in long-term durability in the repairs. Uh, both methods coming in at about 95% freedom from reoperation at 10 years. So there's just a piece of aorta being cut away, and I make a sort of S incision when I do the aortoplasty and um, then complete the uh, repair of the ascending aorta. So here's the post uh, procedure echo with no leakage from the valve and a nice approximation of the leaflets with a good opening and the gradients were very low and so hopefully this is going to hold up well for the patient long term. We have about a 2% uh, to 3% failure rate in the first one and a half years after the repairs and the gradients um, also go down with time. So the lowest gradient typically after repair is about 18 months after the repair based on our own research. So if you have a slight gradient, don't be too concerned about it. Don't abandon the valve because of that, because over time, as the 
inflammation and etc gets um, absorbed uh, that seems to improve obviously if you've got a severe stenosis then that's not a valve you should be keeping and you shouldn't have made it so tight that um, you have a severe stenosis so we will then go ahead and also uh, just show how using this repair can be used um, for remodeling operation.